property restoration. With almost four decades of experience, John oversees complex restoration jobs specializing in historic preservation and large loss management. His experience ranges from hands-on restoration to senior estimator, consultant, and project manager. So this broad range of expertise is something I'm sure we'll all benefit from today. So please join me in welcoming John Rubisky. John? Well, thank you, Nancy. Uh, four decades makes it sound like I'm really old. Let's go here to presentation mode. All right, everybody see that okay? So um, I'd like to start off by, uh, first of all, thanking Nancy and Brian and Bob for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to share some thoughts and ideas with this group. Uh, certainly, as, as Brian mentioned, I uh, encourage questions throughout. Um, you know, feel free to, uh, if you have questions or comments, feel free to, um, to either send it through the chat or, uh, or speak up. So the uh, agenda for today is uh, just to kind of go over some things with you, preparing for the unthinkable, uh, know your insurance policy. I'm going to talk about some basic guidelines of what to do if a disaster does occur. Um, we've got a short video of a uh, case study of the Sarah Jordan boarding house, which I think is, uh, is very interesting. It'll be uh, something that um, be, be very valuable and help uh, express my concerns here with historic preservation after a disaster. <clears throat> so uh, I'll share some statistics, uh, talk to you about some insurance information. Um, and again, I, I want to, I've got a disclaimer that I have to, uh, to lay out here, I'm not an insurance salesperson. My goal is not to try to sell you insurance, but it is just to highlight the different types of insurance policies so that you are better equipped to go back and look at your policy to see if you are properly insured. And if, if so, uh, or if not, I guess, you'd, you'd go back to your agent and talk to them about uh, making some modifications. Um, so with that, uh, we can begin here. So it's important when we think about uh, disaster preparedness that we think about the different types of disasters that it could occur. And certainly there are disasters that could occur anywhere in any time, but there are also disasters that's, that would occur specifically by region, such as hurricanes or winter conditions up here in the north or uh, drought that can cause different types of disasters in, in the warmer climate. So, uh, so it's really important that we look at those different types of disasters. And I've got some examples of different things that you should be aware of and, and think about. Um, wind storms is an example, uh, tornadoes, straight line winds, we have those happen uh, quite frequently up in our area here in Michigan. Uh, hurricanes down in the coastal regions, uh, storms uh, that, that cause power outages. So wind storms may cause trees to fall. Um, we have numerous calls after storms for trees that have fallen on buildings, on power lines. Uh, and that creates another problem if the power goes out suddenly, um, that you have, to be, you have to be thinking forward for when that power goes back on and make sure that, uh, that you're protecting yourselves properly. We often get fires called in after the power is re-energized because people have forgotten to turn off a stove or some type of electrical component that may have been damaged. So. So these are things that I think are important to keep in mind uh, of different types of disasters that, that could occur naturally. Um, fires are, are primarily what I will be talking about today because they cause the most significant amount of damage. And according to the uh, National Insurance Bureau, while there are uh, the, the most frequent amount of claims, frequent number of claims are hail damage claims, but the highest dollar value paid out in claims are as a result of fire. So for this purpose, we'll be talking about uh, fire claims. And, and fires happen in a, for a variety of different reasons from uh, electrical, short in the, say, electrical wiring in the wall um, that you may not be aware of. Maybe it's faulty equipment. It could be a, a furnace or some type of mechanical system. It may be a faulty appliance. Uh, surprising the number of fires that we do with as a result of faulty uh, appliances such as refrigerators, dryers, uh, those type of things. Um, lightning strikes are quite frequent uh, up in our area here in, in Michigan. 
Um, not as frequent are, are forest fires or wildfires, but certainly we're hearing a lot about them on the West Coast right now. And uh, just unbelievable amount of damage as a result of these wildfires that are sweeping across the country there. Um, and then other type of fires being uh, accidental fires, um, cooking, smoking. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, that cause uh, accidental fires to occur. Um, and then intentional fires, um, fire bombings, uh, terrorism, um, civil unrest. I mean, there's, there's a whole handful of things to think about uh, in types of, of fire disasters that could occur. Um, and, and really, uh, they happen quite frequently. I think the, uh, the National Fire uh, NFPA, National uh, Fire Board indicates that fire departments respond to a fire somewhere in the country every 23 seconds. Uh, so that's an awful lot of, of fires that are occurring. And many times we don't hear about them or we don't know about them. And when you speak to people outside of our industry, oftentimes they'll say um, they didn't even realize that this type of restoration industry existed because um, you know, they, they just don't know of a lot of occurrences, but I can assure you they happen quite frequently. Uh, floods are another type of, uh, of, of concern when you're thinking about preparing for disaster and protecting your, uh, your, your property and your contents. Um, floods can be a result of frozen pipes, um, again, more often in the northern climates, but it's not unfrequent that we have um, some cold snaps that cause frozen pipes, plumbing failures, fire suppression malfunctions. Uh, imagine the amount of damage that could occur if a fire suppression system should go off, a valve be broken, or so forth. Um, we've, we will at times go out and do kind of a, uh, a pre-inspection of, uh, of properties for their owners and help them identify uh, some concerns. One of them we went to was uh, in the, uh, the archive department for a, uh, a large corporation here in Michigan. And in looking through their, their uh, archival room, uh, they had a sprinkler head right uh, about, uh, I would say, less than a foot away from the top shelf where they were storing documents. Um, easily be bumped when you're putting a box up there on the shelf. So one of the things that we were talking about is thinking about ways to uh, rearrange that room so they're not, uh, they're not infringing on that uh, fire suppression valve. Uh, sewer backups are another common concern, can cause some substantial damage. Uh, and then uh, stormwater or groundwater. Um, you may recently remember the uh, Midland floods from uh, Sanford Lake when the dams broke up in uh, Midland. Uh, and we were up there doing a lot of work. And if you could imagine a lake, I was talking to some of the residents who said they were sitting on their back porch, kind of watching the water rise when the dam broke and within two hours, the lake was empty. It's an awful lot of water uh, rushing through that, that area. And there were a number of buildings that were completely wiped out, taken off their foundation and gone. So by the time we got up there a couple of days later, they're gone. And you know, if you're not prepared with, with inventories and some type of documentation of what you had, it becomes very difficult in managing your claim to make sure that you are being uh, you know, reimbursed for everything that you, that you may have had. So uh, just something to think about there. Uh, and then again, there's, there's winter conditions are always a concern here uh, in the North with uh, ice dams that could occur on roofs, uh, snow loads, we get an awful lot of uh, roof collapses throughout the winter uh, when, when we have heavy snow loads uh, in, in Every year we deal with ice damming when the, uh, we get um, a, a quick thaw and then a free freeze again. So during the day it's thawing, at night it freezes and ice builds up around the eaves and, the, and then the gutters and causes water to back up into the roof and, and does interior damage. So um, all things that, uh, th that are um, potential concerns, especially in historic buildings and uh, where you have, uh, precious contents to be concerned about. So 
to make sure that we talk about the different types of disasters that could occur. Uh, the other thing, and if there's one, if there's one takeaway that I hope that you all leave with, it's this, uh, is to really understand your insurance policy and, and talk to your insurance agent. Uh, review your documents, your policy documents. There are a number of different types of policies that are referred to as replacement cost policies. And generally, those are the best type of policies you can get. However, there's a policy called a functional use replacement cost, which is low premiums and, 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 and they don't uh, replace items with like kind and quality material. They would replace them with new conventional inexpensive type of material. So if you have a, <clears throat> a plaster wall, as an example, that's damaged, a functional use policy would pay to replace drywall in its place. Um, while that might not seem too important, it is when we're doing historic preservation. <clears throat> Wood windows uh, would be replaced with a less expensive version of a vinyl window. Uh, and wood siding and so forth would be replaced with a vinyl type of siding or, or some other uh, inexpensive um, alternative. So functional use replacement cost, while there is a place for that type of policy, it isn't the best when, it, when, when you're concerned about historic preservation after a disaster. Um, next level of policy that we've run into is called actual replacement cost. Uh, ACV policy. You might hear somebody talk about ACV. That is replacing it with like kind and quality material up to your policy limits. Now, it's, imp it's really important that you know what your policy limit should be. Many times people, when they go to get insurance, think that it should be the value of the property when they purchased it, Maybe it's the value of, uh, of the property, the, the, the market value. It may even be the cost to rebuild it at today's standards, but that's not always the case, especially when it comes to historic preservation. The, people don't build things today like they used to. So going on new construction pricing for a historic property, uh, it doesn't, doesn't add up. I oftentimes uh, think of uh, properties similar to those in the Boston Edison district. Um, home values there are, are reasonable. You can get a very nice, a beautiful built uh, uh, property, but you can't replace it for the cost that you can buy it for today. So actual cash value will pay you for the uh, replacement cost up to your policy limit. So it's important to know your policy limits. Um, Extended replacement cost. It's a step up from the ACV policies where you can purchase up to an additional, in some cases, 20% above your policy limit. Uh, that's helpful in that if you, with pricing as it is today in construction, uh, material cost for some, even for soft lumber has gone up 85% in the last year labor costs have gone up. Everything is skyrocketing as a result of the pandemic that we're experiencing. So extended replacement costs can help bridge that gap from what you truly would, what, what it would have cost to build it to give you a 20% a uh, above policy limit uh, cushion. So that is about the third level. And then the, the best policy that you can get would be considered a replacement guaranteed replacement cost, which will replace the building with like kind and quality material, regardless of the cost. So guaranteed replacement cost is, is ultimately the best. And, and some of the examples that we'll talk about uh, are guaranteed replacement cost. You'll see the video of the Sarah Jordan, which, which had um, a phenomenal, phenomenal insurance. Uh, versus actual replacement cost and functional replacement cost. So we're going to talk about some case studies with all three of those. Uh, and then there's another policy that is um, uh, 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 that's available called an actual cash value. It has nothing to do with replacement cost. It is the actual cash value of that structure the day before the loss. 
And that doesn't mean the actual cash value to rebuild the building. It means the, the value of that structure as it stood the day before the loss. So if it is in disrepair or being rebuilt or being worked on or cared for, uh, it may not be at its, at its full value. So, so the actual cash value policy oftentimes leaves people short of being able to repair it as it was. Um, so, so again, I'm spending a lot of time on this because this is what I believe to be the most critical component in preservation after a disaster is making sure that you're fully prepared with the right policy. So um, I hope that makes sense. I would open it up for any questions of any of this. And I would hope that you go back and look at your policy to make sure you're covered properly. Uh, yeah, those are, I mean, critical, critical advice, but, uh, and certainly if you have a question about that, feel free to, to chime in. Uh, I do have one comment that would I would maybe have you address here as well, uh, John, to kind of give people the perspective of the services that you offer and the breadth of your clients without a lot of name dropping, but Thomas uh, Winks points out, he believe I saw your company at the GM Tech Center during the August 2014 flooding. So not to ask you to do a bunch of name dropping, but Give, give people an idea of the scale and the size of clients that you work with from someone's home all the way up to you know a, a major corporation like General Motors. Sure. Uh, well, uh, give you a, a really quick summary, kind of a, a brief history. And I, I don't want this to be a commercial either for what we do, but we started out in, uh, in Dearborn, Michigan, uh, one building, one location, um, some nearly 70 years ago at the corner of Tyronman and Schaefer. And we have grown to be a worldwide uh, organization. We are still owned by the same family. We are uh, solely owned. And we have clients that range from um, uh, historical, you know, uh, people that own historical properties to commercial properties to, to uh, um, medical facilities to commercial, like, like General Motors. Uh, we do. We're on the, uh, the, the task force for General Motors, so if they have a loss uh, and somebody locally can't handle the disaster, they call us. And they also make sure that all of their vendors and, and suppliers use us too if they can't provide the service quick enough. So, uh, so we've, we've grown quite a bit over the years. Uh, we started out making just uh, aluminum awnings for homes, and uh, it developed into a um, kind of a disaster restoration company. Um, we really were on the forefront of this industry because back then there, there weren't a lot of quote unquote disaster restoration companies. So um, yes, we do do a lot of work at, at GM and the tech center and, and so forth. So it gives, gives perspective that very broad range of, of clientele from the, the small to the very, very large. So that, that yes, uh, and interestingly, I think in Michigan, we do, um, we do over uh, about 3,500 jobs a year uh, average job that we do is in the neighborhood of about uh, $11,000. So we do an awful lot of small jobs. We do a, a lot of big jobs too. But, um, but it's just, it's interesting when you look at the number of jobs that the average is as low as it is because the ones that we'll be speaking of are, are larger projects. Sure. Well, one more question that it may come up actually as we go into these examples, but uh, Thoughts about, I mean, your property restoration, and you talked about the, the importance of really assessing that insurance situation, but thoughts about the content. So you, one thing is the structure in the building, but what about the things that are in the building? Those, those things oftentimes go hand in hand, but you know, in, in this case, how separate are they? When you talk about what's in the building, how you value that. Uh, that, that will come up a little bit uh, later, and, and they really do go hand in hand uh, in terms of looking at ways to reduce uh, uh, risk with your collections as well as your, your, your properties that you may have. So uh, we will talk a little bit about that. Um, my background is in uh, content restoration and in uh, antique restoration as well. So if anybody does have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to talk about that um, if I don't address it fully in the presentation. Okay. Okay, right. yeah, I think we're ready to uh, move forward. So here are a couple of other important terms that you should be aware of when it comes to uh, insurance. Um, Coinsurance oftentimes exists in policies and you must make sure that, that uh, if you do have that clause that you are properly insured with the right values. As an example, just to, just to pick numbers, 
if your property is valued at a hundred thousand dollars, let's say, and you only have eighty percent or eighty thousand dollars worth of coverage, you may be subject to a coinsurance clause, which would mean insurance is only going to pay 80% of the claim because they look at you as a co-insurer. Not all policies have it, but some do. And it's, it's, a, it's a bad time to find out you have it after a disaster. So that's a co-insurance clause. Really important that you look at that and see if, if that applies to you. Um, the, the other thing that is very, very important is to understand what your policy limits and make sure that you are insured at the right value of uh, uh, replacement cost, insurable value versus market value. There's a, there's a big difference. Again, thinking about the um, historic properties in the Boston Edison district, the, insure, the market value is much different than the insurable value. Um, there is a website here that you could go to. It's called myhomesafetyplan.com. And there is a insurable value calculator there. So if anybody were interested, they could write down this, this website and you can go there and, and put in information specific about your property. And it will give you what the recommendation would be for the insurable value. Uh, Here's an example, it's kind of hard to see it, but an example of what you would, get, the report that you would get back. So you're entering the, the state, the, uh, the year built, uh, the size of the building, um, number of bedrooms, bathrooms, and so forth. And this is, this is primarily residential. And then different information about how it was constructed with the exterior siding, uh, the shingles, the, the windows, interior information such as plaster, um, hard, hard and soft carpet uh, surfaces for your flooring, cabinets and countertops. And it will calculate a replacement cost at 2018 standards. So uh, it hasn't taken into consideration this pandemic yet, but, but this is the uh, this particular building to rebuild that building using common material today would be about $227,000. But additional considerations that you need to think about when insuring your historic property are um, environmental concerns. Uh, there may be lead or asbestos or different types of fees that are involved in uh, abatement or remediation. Uh, so it, it, it works in a, a, a calculation for that. And then when it comes to replacing that building, you're not gonna rebuild it with common material. You're gonna wanna build it back with material similar to what was used back at the time it was, it was built. So it, it also takes into consideration some historic preservation costs that you might incur to get that building back to shape. Now, in this particular example, the, uh, the replacement cost was 227,000, but it's recommending that the insurable value be 408,000. Seems to be quite substantial. Um, but again, in some of these, the, these next few um, slides that we go through, we'll see where that plays out in the amount of money that you would spend in additional premiums pale in comparison to what you would lose if you have a disaster. Um, so with that, we'll talk about a few things to, to be prepared for if a disaster does strike. John, I have a question. Certainly. Is it advisable to have an appraisal done before you buy the insurance policy? Uh, it, it certainly will help. Um, it sometimes can be expensive to have an appraisal done. Uh, that, um, that website that I, I pointed out was a free site that you can use. And what people have done was actually taken that to their insurance agent to show them, here's what I have. I want to make sure that we're covered. Um, so if you don't mind spending the money for the appraisal, it's a great idea. It'd be great information to have should you have a, uh, a, a major disaster that you'd have some documented information. Um, and if you wanted to do it a little bit less expensively and, uh, and get similar information, that free website works as well. So great question and a very a great point. Thank you for, for bringing that up. Could you go back to that um, site again? I haven't finished writing it down. Oh, sure. It is 
homesafetyplan.com. It's also in the chat. Insure, and then forward slash insurable hyphen value. Thank you. This particular site um, was designed for um, a disaster uh, preparedness for uh, residential settings. Uh, fire departments use it for um, damage assessment after a loss. Uh, insurance agents use it to value properties when they're selling, make sure that the, um, the insured to value uh, is, is proper on buildings. And it's, it's good throughout the uh, 50 states as well as um, uh, the Mariana Islands uh, and uh, Guam. So it's pretty pretty handy little tool. All right, so, so back to what to do if a disaster strikes. Most important thing. Uh, oftentimes people are concerned about saving their property and their contents. Nothing more important than life safety first. Uh, you, you got to make sure the building is safe before you enter it. In the case of a fire, you have to make sure that the fire department has released the building. Uh, every fire is considered to be a crime scene until the investigation is complete. Investigations can sometimes take take weeks to, to uh, complete, which means you may not be able to get in that building for weeks. Um, so again, once you have the ability to enter, you've got to be sure that you're entering safely, uh, taking all the necessary precautions. Um, we recommend that you notify your insurance company as quickly as possible. We're, we work with a lot of uh, fire departments around the country and oftentimes we're contacted by the fire department to come out and secure the property uh, the day of or the night of the fire. We will oftentimes get there while they are still on scene. In fact, many times they wait for us to make sure that we get there to secure that property. And that's the time that we suggest that you notify your insurance company as soon as possible. They are also a good resource to help you manage through this, this uh, devastation that you're about to uh, encroach upon. Uh, secure the scene. Again, once the scene is released by the fire department, it may be that you're securing a room if it's a smaller event. It could be that you have to secure the whole building. Uh, in, in many, many cases, properties are uh, uninhabitable after a disaster, uh, such as a fire, and we have to secure the entire property to make sure that, um, that folks don't try to get in to see what's going on, see what happened. Um, People become very curious of, of something like this and uh, certainly don't want anybody getting hurt trying to you know, climb through a window with broken glass or whatever. Uh, and then you got a liability claim as well. So um, securing the scene is critically important. Make sure that all equipment is turned off. In fact, we recommend that if utilities aren't necessary, that all power is turned off. So. Again, with winter conditions, sometimes we will use the gas to provide temporary heat to keep the building from freezing or the, the pipes from freezing. But if that's not necessary, everything should be shut down. Um, that doesn't always mean you're pulling, you know, DTE is coming out and cutting the lines. It may be just you're shutting off the electricity at the, at the box. Uh, fire departments will generally do that. And before we can turn it back on, we have to get uh, licensed mechanical contractors back out there to uh, inspect the site, make sure it's safe, uh, disconnect any circuits that might be damaged, uh, and then they will turn the power back on on a temporary basis for us. Uh, it's critically important that you document the damages. Um, and, and Robert, this is something that, you know, when you brought up the appraisal, uh, by getting an appraisal, you can document the damages prior to the event, but then you have to go back and document what happened at the time of the loss. So, so taking pictures of what happened, uh, taking pictures of damaged contents, uh, oftentimes debris is thrown out of the building, uh, may include part of your collection that gets thrown out of the building. Taking pictures of that where it sits is, is important for you to be able to, um, to 
settle the, the claim with, uh, let's say with a uh, limited amount of, of challenges. They, they, these are never easy to get through, but the more documentation you have, the better off you'll be. Uh, at that point, and, and much of this takes place within about the first 24 hours after a disaster. Now you're, you're evaluating uh, and mitigating the contents. And I think, Brian, this is what you were talking about earlier. You're, you're mitigating the contents and the structure at the same time. You're evaluating the damages and trying to figure out what do we do to prevent additional damage from occurring. So again, it, it may be that we're building containment uh, around a portion of the building so that you can use the other half that's unaffected. It may be that we are uh, extracting water that was used to extinguish the fire and putting drying equipment in there to try to save uh, framing members and, and flooring material and cabinets from uh, absorbing secondary moisture. Maybe it's ventilating the building to help remove smoke odor, which would help both with the contents and the building side of the claim. So the, the, the contents and the structure uh, are, are, are really looked at um, as one unit at this point. Um, most cases, we can't evaluate, you can't really effectively evaluate the structure or repair the structure until the contents are addressed. And, and I believe, uh, Nancy, you mentioned earlier that um, in, an, in an earlier session with, uh, you, you spoke with somebody from Greenfield Village and they talked about restoring their contents from the Sarah Jordan boarding house. Um, so that took place prior to us getting involved. Uh, so, so really once you've done kind of the evaluation and, and documenting, the contents are the, most, the next most important step to address so that work can begin on the structure. And, uh, and of course, many of the content items would include the, the, um, the collections that you have. All right, so let's, uh, at this point, I want to do a, a video, run this video uh, of the historic Spread Jordan boarding house. And we'll talk a little bit about that and, and a couple of other cases that we were on and, and again, open it up for questions for you. Yeah, and before we get to uh, the video, John, one uh, note that was made in the uh, comments privately, Roger Luxick uh, from the Packer Proving Grounds pointed out, uh, Bob asked this question about appraisal. He said the typical commercial appraisal is ranging between five and $7,000. So if you've got a tool like the one that, that we posted to the chat, it seems like a valuable one to get the ball rolling versus, uh, like I said, what the typical cost of the appraisal is. So just to keep that in mind, as we clutch our pearls about uh, how that goes. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and start the video. This is the story of the historic restoration of the Sarah Jordan Boarding House, part of the Henry Ford, America's greatest history attraction in Dearborn, Michigan. Originally part of Thomas Edison's Menlo Park Research Complex in New Jersey, the duplex home was built in 1870 and converted into a boarding house in 1878. The site was one of the first ever wired for electricity on the first floor in 1879 as part of a public demonstration of Edison's incandescent light bulb. We have breaking news right now in Dearborn, a fire at Greenfield Village. Captain Dennis Neubacher is over the scene in Choppers. On Monday, January 6th, 2009, a fire in the house caused extensive damage to the porch, roof, first floor living rooms, front upstairs bedrooms, and smoke damage in the upper floor areas. Firefighters responded quickly to the scene, and volunteer employees from the Henry Ford were also able to save many of the house's original artifacts. Belfour USA was brought in to oversee the house's restoration. Belfour construction specialists worked on every step of the project to ensure measures were taken to preserve historical accuracy and that any original building materials would be salvaged. Here, the electricians discussed the measures taken to remove the wiring, blocks, and bulbs and properly label them so they can be reinstalled upon restoration of the we'll building. Get this down first here so it's out of our way. Yeah, we'll take all these and, and, and 
make sure they're packaged properly so they don't get damaged during uh, the renovation. And you see we take care of not making sure we, we don't kink the wiring and then it'll hang just as it was. We wrapped it in bubble wrap and then strapped it to this 2x4, of course labeling it what room it came out of. A review of measurements and floor plans drove the methods behind how the restoration process came together. Uh, what I'm doing is I'm out here to measure the house and get it all drawn on AutoCAD. So I'm just going to take the plan they have and measure everything myself and make sure it's exact. Just to have it on record exactly what was original and what's been replaced uh, during this construction process. Whenever possible, Belfour ensured that original building materials were salvaged, cleaned, and reused during the rebuilding. The windows that were destroyed during the blaze on both floors had there to be right rebuilt. right now is uh, assembling one of the two windows. He's measuring the parts of the sash. He's got one of the frames dry fitted. And he's going to put it into position and hit that. And that machine will put it in place and square it up at the same time meeting rail here and once it goes into the window it's simply it's part of the part of the unit. Once it's primed and painted it won't look any different than the original fabric of the building. And uh, once this comes together it will look original um, in, in every detail. Belfour employees also had to determine original measurements to shape and install new beams that would support the front of the house. They had to notch out for the uh, ceiling joists which also receives the gutter system, the copper gutter system for the upper roof. Copper roofing panels above the front porch that were damaged had to be completely replaced. The new copper sheets were measured, bent and cut, and then fitted and welded together. Unlike today's homes, where drywalling is more common, plaster was used to cover the interior walls. Extensive repainting occurred in not only the rooms being reconstructed, but also in the upper hallways and back bedrooms where smoke had blackened the original walls. With the combined work of Belfour and the Henry Ford, the house was quickly restored to its authentic grandeur. Belfour's ability to preserve much of the original construction materials, combined with expert replication and restoration skills, guarantees the Sarah Jordan Boarding House will be welcoming visitors for years to come. take the screen back over here. So interesting thing about the Sarah Jordan boarding house was uh, they had um, guaranteed replacement cost coverage. It was part of a larger umbrella. So there was no, no issue at all with the uh, coverage amount or the policy limits. Um, we were one of uh, many companies that were bidding on the, uh, the restoration and we were not the cheapest bid. In fact, we were the highest bid uh, to do this particular project. And, and the insurance allows the, the property owner to make the decision who they're going to go with. Uh, so if you happen to select the highest bid, but the insurance company is only willing to pay the lesser amount, then it becomes a negotiating factor between the contractor and the owner or the insurance company. In this case, there was no issue with that. The insurance company selected us, the insurance company paid our fee. Uh, as you can see, there were many things that were done in that job that wouldn't be done in a typical project, such as removing the light fixtures, wrapping them the way that they were, replacing the walls with plaster. Um, the, the, one of the things that, uh, that tipped the scales in our favor in getting this particular job was when we were evaluating the loss with the, um, with the uh, conservators and historians from Henry Ford and Greenfield Village, uh, I asked the question as to whether or not they would like us to restore and salvage the nails used in, in the building of the project. 
And uh, other contractors thought that's a little bit overboard. As it turns out, the Sarah Jordan boarding house, unlike some of the buildings in Greenfield Village, is the actual home that was in Menlo Park, New Jersey. And in fact, every nail that they were able to salvage was cataloged. So it was important that we saved the nails, we saved the, um, uh, the wood lath, we saved everything that we could. We even saved as much of the burned uh, building materials and, uh, and, and would either indicate that we replaced material with like kind and quality. We weren't going to Home Depot to buy uh, two by six or two by eight. We were having everything milled, so it was milled to the exact size with a similar species of wood. Uh, and we were marking each piece that we replaced, as you saw in the video, with a stamp saying that this piece was replaced and the date, or this, place, this piece was repaired with a date. Uh, because at some point in the future, if anybody ever opened the walls up and looked at that building, it was important to Henry Ford that they knew, and, and everybody knew, that this fire was part of the history, and this is what took place to restore it. Now, the other important piece to, to keep in mind is that uh, it was Henry Ford's um, request that no power tools be used inside that building. So we could use power tools outside that we provided our own electricity for with generators, but we had to take the, the, the cut material inside, hand chisel it or shape it to fit properly with hand tools on the inside. So it was done as close to what we could do to the way it was originally built. Um, the fire was originally believed to be started from a spark that was uh, caused when they were replacing the gutters um, in January, getting it ready for, uh, you know, for reopening in the spring. Um, after they, they were done with the, their work, they left, uh, the, the, the workers left the scene and about six o'clock the fire broke out. So, so they believe an ember fell between the walls um, resting on the, uh, on the very old and dried um, framing material caught on fire and, and you saw the damages that it occurred. So again, this was a guaranteed replacement cost policy, never a question of cost. The insurance company paid uh, higher than the, the, the highest bid of all that came through. Um, and it was a, a, a real treat to be able to, uh, to work on a property such as this uh, with the standards that we had to meet um, in doing so. So, um, so that's an example of a um, replacement, guaranteed replacement cost policy. All right, let's see. Here we go. Next one that I wanted to talk about was um, case study number two. This is a, uh, an actual cash value policy. Uh, total cost of the project was $5.2 million. Um, the settlement amount originally, uh, uh, the original proposed settlement amount by the insurance company was $3.4 million. Um, impossible to rebuild this building to, uh, to the standards that needed to be. Now, this particular building was located in a historic district. It was on the uh, National Historic Register of Deeds. Uh, and in order for it to remain on the Historic Register of Deeds, it had to be rebuilt to the Secretary of the Interior standards, uh, which the insurance company wasn't willing to pay for. Um, the Historic Commission in this particular city uh, had a, an awful lot of clout. And the only option was, which they were completely against, was to demolish the building and put up something different uh, or to restore it. Um, but they were not in favor of the demolish it uh, unless it absolutely was the only possible option available. Um, so loss occurred in May of 2008. Uh, we received our final um, uh, negotiated settlement of a payment December of 2013. It was three years of litigation on this. A final settlement was $4.8 million. Um, we agreed early on because of kind of our desire to save the property uh, that 
we would accept whatever settlement, the insurance settlement or the lawsuit provided and not ask the, the property owner to pay any, any additional. That's, that's relatively rare, but we felt we had a good case going into it if we weren't gonna get uh, the full amount that we were expecting. Uh, this particular building won several awards, the Mr. Michigan Historic Preservation Network Building Award of 2013 and the Ann Arbor Historic District Preservation Project of the Year Award. Um, again, it's, it's, it was, we felt a reasonable risk to take to save the building, originally built in 1904 uh, by Albert Kahn. Uh, and it was one of the only buildings, since you know it's Ann Arbor on the University of Michigan property that was, that was uh, uh, designed, commissioned, and uh, by the same owners that are still using it today and still for the intended purpose that it was originally built for. So, so we had to use material in this building, uh, plaster material that matched the quality of the plaster that was used back in 2004. There were only eight plasterers in the country that were familiar with using this type of material, which we had to bring them in. Um, we had craftsmen from Romania that helped us with carving uh, the architectural pieces out in the front of the building. Uh, it, was, it was a, again, phenomenal project to work on, um, but it was fraught with many challenges, primarily due to the insurance that they, uh, that they had. Um, again, we, we agreed, so it didn't end up costing the property owners a lot of money at the end, to accept whatever settlement we were eventually happy to finally close this file out um, some five years later after the data loss. Um, but again, that's, a, that's, a, that's a, a real testament to why it's important to know your policy, to make sure that you're properly covered with the proper policy limits. So this, this other project that we had, um, $1.6 million uh, estimate. Again, fire caused after doing repairs to a roof. Uh, this was a functional use policy. Uh, insurance initially offered $780,000 was, was the amount they were going to pay. In, uh, because again, their philosophy is that they're not gonna pay you to replace it with like kind and quality material, but they will pay to replace it with some type of functional material. It didn't matter that it was a historic building. It didn't matter that, uh, that there were certain standards that we were trying to meet. Uh, it was months and months of negotiations that took place. Uh, and in the end, we weren't able to get enough to, to do everything that we would have wanted to do. We're unable to perform all, perform all the aspects of the restoration. Uh, and the building owner ended up contributing some money to the repair cost. Um, again, they tried to do some things to help keep the cost down wherever they could. Uh, we tried to manage it as best we could and, and do the financially the right thing for everybody. Um, but you, know, you can only imagine the devastation that you would experience after a disaster like this uh, to find out that you don't have enough insurance to repair it properly. Now what do we do? Uh, and, and it was uh, a, a road that I wouldn't want anybody to go down. And it is, it, it's really the reason why um, I spend as much time as I do talking about making sure that you have proper coverage and, and proper, um, the proper type of policy. <clears throat> so in closing, the things that I hope that you, uh, you take away <clears throat> are, are just be prepared for the unthinkable. Uh, they do happen here in Michigan over, over 3,000 times a year that we respond to uh, unthinkable disasters for people. Um, <clears throat> know your insurance policy. It kind of the, 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 the key words that I spoke of earlier with the replacement cost and the co-insurance and policy limits. <clears throat> and of course, know what to do if a disaster strikes. And so hopefully that's something that you would be able to walk away with after this presentation. <clears throat> this time I'd open it up for any questions that you might have.
I'm going to uh, feel one and, and certainly feel free to chime in if you have any other questions or maybe even examples. Again, I know folks on this call have been through some of these sorts of issues and to, to what level of extremity uh, we can always discuss, but it's maybe cathartic, if nothing else, to share with your, your colleagues and say, well, we went through this and this is what happened. Uh, and it didn't have to be with Bill for that's okay too. But, um, you know, certainly feel free to share, but I will uh, ask a question, uh, Bill Greenwood asked, what types of jobs uh, do you decline to bid on? So there, is there ever a time where you are unable to help a person? Um, we we don't, we actually will, we look at every job that comes through or will at least consider it. And when we decline a job is when there is absolutely not enough insurance to pay, the owner is not able to pay and there, there's no way to do the job properly. So it's, it's a very difficult uh, discussion to have. It's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, and and they're, they're very few and far between where it, it gets to that point. But um, you know, we have had jobs in the past where we've had to decline them because there just wasn't enough finances to do the job properly. Sure, thank you. Uh, and Tim Paul uh, from the uh, Cadillac LaSalle uh, Museum asked, what types of insurance would you recommend as best for a museum. So you kind of talked about this at the beginning, um, you know, and detailed out the level of coverages that would be offered, but what type would you sort of zero in? I'm sure there's a there's a case by case uh, thing that you'd have to go through here, but do you have any broad advice for that or uh, for museums? Uh, the, the, that's a, a, a great question for an insurance agent to answer, but from my experience, the guaranteed replacement cost policies are the best type of policies to have. Um, and, and oftentimes, you know, your relationship with your insurance agent is, is critical. So if you speak to them, explain to them what you have, give them an idea of the values that you're looking at insuring and make sure that they provide you with what you need. Um, but again, our experience has been the replace, guaranteed replacement cost, as in the Sarah Jordan example, um, was was probably the best type of policy to have. Sure, sure. It's, be, it's better to be over covered than sort of under covered and, and hoping and scraping. It seems like that's the message. Uh, so a question again about contents. Uh, you mentioned restoring structures, but do you have some other examples of restoring content? So that we really dig into the nitty gritty of how that happens. Um, we have, uh, a, I don't have any case studies that I could easily pull up, but we have done um, uh, antique, um, I guess, preservation style projects on collections that people have had, uh, residential collections, um, uh, some of them have been um, archival uh, uh, artifacts that people have had uh, in their uh, collections, um, and and in many cases the restoration of those of those items requires them being taken off site, much like you saw in the Sarah Jordan video, which they were taken from that location to a cleaner environment where it's a stable environment, and then the restoration begins. And we do have a ability to do that with uh, with contents. Um, and we can, you know, we do all types of, of preservation, uh, uh, whether it be with, um, you know, with, with wood furniture or case goods or, or ceramic or pottery or, you know, glassware, silverware, um, upholstered goods and so forth. So um, I, it's kind of vague, but I hope that answered the question sufficiently. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of our participants obviously operating in the automotive uh, heritage space, whether they're maintaining collections or archives, which we've heard about through the past several weeks, or of course, those who have physical artifacts, including all the way up to, you know, automobiles, that, you know, that this is that nightmare scenario that they kind of think about, are we prepared enough? And I hope everyone uh, is taking heed as we go through this discussion, again, take the time to uh, ask the questions. Um, in fact, I can recall that in my role as the uh, board member at the National Auto History Collection, uh, which is the largest sort of collection of two-dimensional uh, materials in automotive history, there was a leak that damaged, you know, some materials in the upper level of the library, and they again had to do this. So content restoration was a big part of that. The building itself was not, you know, overly compromised by the leak, but the, the materials in there were, were definitely worse. So I think that's an important note to, to add to people. Uh, thought processes. Think about those contents for sure. Uh, 
Yeah, that, that's a great point too, um, Brian. We had uh, recently uh, did a project where we were um, salvaging documents, uh, historic documents, um, and it's, it's all varieties of media for historic documents from books to papers to files to blueprints to mm -hmm. uh, you know just anything you could think of. Uh, we, we had to pack up uh, over 13,000 uh, book and record boxes. So that's about half the size of a banker box. Uh, 13,000 boxes of records that we uh, cleaned from various degrees of damage from, uh, from fire, uh, smoke, heat, water. I mean, some of them were damaged by all of the perils. So, uh, so there are ways, even photographs, we are even able to do restoration on, uh, on photographs. Um, oftentimes they get wet and they fuse together. We've had success in, in, in re-wetting them to be able to separate them and dry them and, and salvage them. So, um, so there's a whole lot of things that, that, that uh, need to take place after a disaster and, and content certainly is an important piece of that. Sure, sure. And I think, I think everyone here would be sensitive to the most recent uh, example we have, I think that everyone's aware of is the, the flooding in mid-Michigan and, and sort of what happens there. We've been in contact with museum partners in that part of the state and, and they sort of had to go through that exact process that you're describing. Did you have any a role in that, you know, in that most recent uh, mitigation? Midland. Uh, referring to the Midland area? Yes. Yes. Yes, we did. We did a lot of um, uh, a lot of mitigation work out there. We we're, we were helping some of our um, our clients and universities and medical offices and and um, some commercial and residential clients with their uh, their personal belongings and and some of them uh, historic documents and records. We're helping with the drying and. Um, you know, you, you can imagine when something of that magnitude happens, it's all hands on deck to, to move things, get them out of harm's way, figure out how we can neutralize this, this uh, damage from getting worse. Uh, mold will start to develop on documents uh, within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and so, you know, we're, we do a lot with freeze drying. We start freeze drying things quickly to be able to then uh, reverse the process and dry them and and, and be able to salvage what we can. No, that's, no, that's great. We, we certainly appreciate you chiming in. Bob, did you have a question? Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's not really a disaster, but when you have government actions, for example, uh, my wife was uh, in charge of relocation for the state highway department, and they decided to take the warehouse museum in uh, Grand Rapids. So she had to replace, uh, the, was you know, she was in charge of the uh, replacing museum and the thousands of artifacts. She had to work through between the federal government, the local people and the state and the museum people. And also they had uh, dead Indians there. So they had to work with Indian tribes to really relocate them. I just wondered if John had any uh, similar situations with government actions that would uh, maybe uh, uh, that resulted in relocate a museum or buildings, historical buildings. For example, if you have a, say a car museum, the highway department wants to use that right away how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, uh, I, I know it's kind of outside of, of of our purview, if you will. However, we have had some experience working with uh, government agencies uh, such as FEMA uh, after a uh, after say a, a, a large scale national disaster, um, but. But that's somewhat, um, I guess, most oftentimes those that we've worked with, our, our client base had their own insurance or proper insurance, and we didn't have to get too involved with FEMA, which can sometimes slow the process down a little bit. Um, so I guess my answer to your, your question was I really don't have a lot of experience with that other than, um, than with uh, organizations such as FEMA. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's it's a great question, you know, for others who operate in that space, and that's a big challenge with what to do um, after a disaster and when it entangles so many others. So, uh, thanks for that, Bob. And uh, I think we we've gone through all of our questions. Uh, so we want to thank John again for sharing so much with us, and hopefully some great advice has been uh, uh, brought forward to those who are on the call here, and and certainly you could follow up if you have any further questions. But even it seems like those who are on here had some great insights to share. Uh, so we appreciate you, uh, John, for joining us. And I might also say that uh, this is the the final uh, Motor Cities Lunch and Learn of the series, not only for the month of October, but for the entire year. So I want to take a moment to thank Nancy Thompson for her curation of this entire series throughout the year. So for those of us who joined us for our first uh, Lunch and Learns, which were uh, about all about social media and marketing and effective communication, uh, thank you for those folks and for those who joined us in June for financial management and grant writing and some things that can help your organization, especially during difficult times, navigate through that. Thank you uh, for those. And of course, those who have been along for the ride for the last couple of weeks on archiving basics all the way up through what do you do when disaster strikes? This has been very helpful, I think, to our constituency. Uh, and by the way, all of these presentations are archived on our YouTube channel. So feel free to go back uh, and take a look at all of those. Uh, along the way. And with that, I'm going to get ready to close out uh, today's presentation with a quick plug for our Motor Cities uh, annual meeting, Auto Heritage Day and Awards of Excellence, which are actually coming up on November the 18th. So November 18th, we would normally be at the state capitol, as per the image you see on the screen, uh, giving out these awards and recognizing that day. The, the day will still be decreed. We'll just do it a little differently. We're going to do it virtually. And uh, invitations have already been sent out. A registration is already available. I'm also going to post it here uh, to the chat uh, for those who want to join us that day. But that day, we'll recap our 2019-2020 and sort of take a look back at that. We'll celebrate Michigan Auto Heritage Day across the state. And, and we'll also recognize our 2020 Awards of Excellence winners in the categories of revitalization, uh, education, tourism, our Volunteer of the Year, and our Milestone Award recipient. So it'll be an exciting uh, day there. Uh, so join us uh, November 18th at 10 a.m. And as always, I want to encourage you to stay, keep in touch with Motor Cities uh, via all of our platforms, our website, uh, all forms of social media. And I mentioned that the YouTube channel hosts all of the uh, videos for these Lunch and Learns, as well as the 10 Motor Cities at Homes, which have already uh, taken place throughout the year. So really a great amount of uh, virtual content available for your perusal and take a look back. And you know we're always learning something new. So we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, and enjoy those. And with that being said, stay tuned for more uh, Motor Cities at Home as they begin to populate on our calendar. Still a few more to come this year. Uh, but other than that, we're going to call today a wrap. And we thank you all for joining us. And we appreciate you. We'll see you down the road. Thanks. Thanks so much, John. I really uh, appreciated your presentation. And uh, it will live on, which is a great thing. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thanks very much. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.